Tonight on All About Android, we've got Juan Bagnell in for Jason Howell to talk the new Pixel 5, Sony's new Android phones, and the latest Tick Watch. We're also going to talk about Carl Pay's exit from OnePlus, the new Google TV app, and why Apple's saying bye-bye to the earpods. All this and so much more up next on All About Android. All About Android is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether employees are working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of All About Android is brought to you by Manscaped. Get the Manscaped Performance Package. It's the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com slash twit. And by LastPass. LastPass can help you manage identities and promote good security behaviors while your employees are remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. And by ZipRecruiter. Hiring is a challenge, especially with everything else you have to consider today. But there's one place where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter. Try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Android. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Hello and welcome to All About Android. This is episode number 294. 494. Wow, I was 200 off. We are recording on October 13th, 2020. We are your latest source for the news, hardware, and apps for the Android faithful. I'm Florence Lyon. And I'm Ron Richards, and we are Jason Howless this week. Jason is out on vacation, so me and, me and Flo are driving the bus uh, over bumpy roads. But <laughs> we couldn't be more delighted to have Juan Bagnell, a.k.a. some gadget guy, what? joining us this week. Uh, Juan, good to see you, sir. It's been, a, it's been a few months. Thanks for joining. Yeah, good to see you guys, too. But I, I have to put it out there, like, what's going on? It, it always seems like I, I, I catch the show, and it seems most frequently that I catch the show when Jason isn't here. Mm. And well, I, I know I it's not want, like a personal hygiene thing. I was so. hoping it wouldn't come up, but Jason's a little <laughs> intimidated by you. So we find it's better to to wait till he's off so that you can come on. Because, you know, Jason, Jason considers Fair himself enough. an audio guy. You're an audio guy. This sure. is, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's like it's, magnets. Yeah. How do they work? <laughs> <laughs> Which is why he no. goes to the woods when you're on, because <laughs> he can't even be within, <laughs> you know, cellular service. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Jason well, loves you, Juan. And in fact, you, you were, you were his. He, he was the one who's like, "What about Juan?" I was like, "Yes, yeah. Juan." So yes. yeah, it was all Jason. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Well, I, I'm 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 really stoked to be back, guys, and 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 you know, especially without all the craziness that's kind of going on in the world right now. Happy to see some familiar faces, and especially on the day that we're talking today, really happy to focus on some Android stuff. Oh, yes. yes, that's oh, a little yes. bit of. A, a little bit of a mm-hmm. theme this week is that is that uh, the, the company across the street uh, dominated the news uh, today <laughs> and this week. So uh, we're we, and we'll t- we'll touch on that a bit, but we're also going to take advantage of the slow news week to spend some time with some cool hardware that you've got for us, Juan. Yeah. So we're pretty excited yeah. for that, right? Yeah, right. looking forward to it. All right, so with that, why don't we dive in and get right into what little news there actually is, Burke? Let's take do it. Away. it. Unlike Carl Pai, I will never leave this venture. Here's Android News. That's really comforting. Wow. I like that transition. That was pretty good towards the end. Um, all right. Well, so this is a uh, this was a requested news story for us to cover uh, by Wesley on Twitter. Wrote in and said, "Please tell me you're going to cover the fact that." Uh, uh, after seven years, OnePlus co-founder Carl Pei is leaving the company, presumably to start a new venture. Uh, OnePlus hasn't confirmed this move yet, but after in- internal documents were posted on Reddit that uh, that showed Pei absent from their leadership structure, um, once those documents emerged, sources close to the matter said that he was he had left the company and is starting his own venture. Uh, so he co-founded OnePlus seven years ago, um, and I guess we're gonna have to now wait and see a for this to become official and b to see what he's gonna do next. Uh, Juan, how much of an impact do you think Carl Pei had on OnePlus? Mm-hmm. You know, like really, how much will this actually change things uh, ver- versus uh, you know not changing things? You know, it's one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is is the cynical response that we've seen in some of the Android circles. Like, oh well, now it's 
it's just always been evident that OnePlus and Oppo and BBK, they were all the same company and that this was just a cynical, you know, uh, strategy for marketing. And I've had several conversations with Carl Pay throughout these uh, various like uh, events that we would hold and get to go and travel to in years past. And, and I think that there was something that was really unique about what it was he was trying to accomplish, even if a good chunk of that was marketing. We didn't have at the time, OnePlus was really building up its fan base. We didn't have that Android enthusiast marketing plug, right? You know, like it felt kind of nice as the gadget geeks to have a company really focusing their message on on this type of community and this this niche population. So when when we see that the the recent transitions that OnePlus has made, I think we've already seen the direction that the company is starting to evolve. The, the direction that they're trying to pivot and go more mass market and that the little glimmers that we get of the Nord brand being handled almost like it's its own separate entity within OnePlus, which is a part of the overall BBK or Oppo umbrella. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear to see that that's the direction that the OnePlus label is already heading. So it kind of makes sense that Carl Pay would I, be looking at other opportunities um, in I other was places looking to go and do something fresh. I was looking at the Nord as like, oh, I wonder if that was the breaking point, right? Or, like, or maybe if, not if, necessarily the the breaking point. I mean, no, I agree with you, like especially in terms of timing, but but more, I, I think the clearer indication of how these companies are now were collaborating, working more closely together, and now it's more regional. You know, there's going to be an Oppo label in some regions, a OnePlus label in other regions, and the Nord is going to be something of a disrupting brand like OnePlus used to be in some regions. And, and I feel like with that kind of groundwork established, someone like Carl Pay probably does want to go off and, and try and tackle some other challenges. Mm. Willing? So, so, I mean, do you think he, he decided to go off on his own or do you think that he, <laughs> he's just kind of forced into... Finding a new venture. You know, I, whether whether or not there's in any kind of internal corporate strife, I mean, uh, it's it's just the realities of working on an enthusiast project. Yes. If it becomes successful, it's gonna pivot and go mainstream. If it's not successful, it's gonna slowly vanish, and no one will ever hear of it again. So, if you're that that type of entrepreneurial spirit where you're trying to do something disruptive, you have to know that eventually your baby is going to grow up and get taken away from you. Like that's just always going to be, uh, the, the path that, that, that kind of, um, creativity is going to walk. So, so I hope, I, I hope he had some sight or some expectation of, man, if I'm really successful with this one plus thing and it blows up, eventually it's going to be a higher profile or a marquee label or a bigger deal. And it's not going to be this little intimate project within, you know, like the smaller confines of the enthusiast space. What, what I'm hoping is now that it's kind of been passed off, you know, to, to more of an OPPO BBK leadership, you know, brand label within that umbrella that we see people like Carl Pay go and try and do something else disruptive in another sector of the, the tech consumer tech industry. Well, so that, that's that, that's my that's that's my other question, which is what you know, do you think he moves on to another like mobile company and does it again or does he expand? You know, and, and this is all speculation. Who knows what the dude's interested <laughs> yeah. in? But I mean, but like, is this like, an, you know, I hate to say hate to cite the, the name, but is it like an Andy Rubin situation where, you know, spins up a new one plus and takes a new approach yeah. at phones? Yeah. You know, I, I kind of hope so. I, I, I think there's this year showed us that there is a lot of um, a lot of interest in disrupting the normal smartphone use scenario, glass on glass slabs at the high end. That means, you know, radical designs and twisting screens and folding screens and modular accessories. And at the lower end, it's, you know, price performance in a very aggressive conversation as we try to roll out 5G. So especially considering his background, you know, where, where he came from before starting up uh, this OnePlus experiment, I think he would be very valuable to a smaller company looking to try and um, uh, shake up the current uh, the, the the current market for for smartphones and services. Hmm. Hmm. This is a tough one because I'm trying to think about how uh, OnePlus is going to get to the level of the foldable phones of kind of <laughs> like you know of right. sending of setting like a certain trend because I think what they've done really well is appeal to 
the enthusiast who wants a really high powered phone or maybe, you know, the enthusiast who wants to buy a phone for their family that sorts of fits in their idea of what a big phone is. But I wonder if OnePlus is going to be able to continue this without Carl Pei at the helm. I really, I really do. I, I wonder if he didn't, he wasn't, you know, he didn't exit too soon is sort of what I'm thinking. Uh, because well, it's, been seven, any- it's, been se- it's been seven years, Flo. I mean, it's been, it's been a while. It, it's, it's, I, f- I feel like he, you know, kind of set the legacy of what OnePlus could be. And to Juan's point, when an organization grows to a certain size, does it then become bigger than just one, per, you know, one person? I mean, really, mm. you know, the only, per, the only, the only person in this space that we've seen have a dominant direction in the direction of a smartphone line has been Steve Jobs, and and he was, you know, True. a once in a lifetime kind of person. Is Carl Pei a, a Steve Jobs type? I don't know. Mm. I mean, Juan, you better. Yeah, I don't know about you know, but, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no I, offense, I just, it's just you know, Steve Jobs is. Yeah, I like mean, George again, Washington. that's. That, yeah. That's a conversation for another podcast on on this yeah. <laughs> podcasting network, I'm sure. Um, no, it, it's the thing I always appreciated about Carl Pei is that he was very candid. Um, I remember an event um, shortly after the OnePlus 6 launch and where, I mean, we're poking through the phone, drinks in hand. It's at the Swank nightclub and he's still going off on like, yeah, we got some work to do on the camera and we really want to try and polish this up. And he was basically laying out for us what the OnePlus 6T was going to be. I mean, it, it was it was very um, unreserved. It was it was very candid and very forthright. And, and those kinds of conversations are invaluable. In, in the tech space when, when you're so looking at people gonna, that have some vision. Who's going to continue it for OnePlus? Because I'm thinking about that too when I was more, you know, out on the floor covering these things, especially with OnePlus, Carl Pei was always mm-hmm. there. He was always talking about the product. He was usually the one giving the presentation. So yeah. I really do wonder, like, what what precedent is that going to set going forward? Um, I know it's been seven years, and maybe I don't understand, you know, company leadership as much as maybe I haven't studied it so much, but it, to me, it just still doesn't seem like a long enough time. I don't know. Uh, I'm just very, I'm very curious this year. I mean, I mean if you this think year's about changing it, a lot about the phone business, yeah. it is. But if you think about how one plus, you know, it went from the one plus one to now we're on yeah. the eight, right? We've gotten eight generations of the phone. We've watched it, you know, emerge from a disruptor, low price phone all the way up to flagship you know, and, and Flo, you made a great point, which is that, you know, how does OnePlus get to the level of Samsung and LG and doing experimental phones and coming up with new form factors and things like that? But, you know, who, and again, we're speculating, but maybe Pei wasn't interested in that. Maybe he was really into the low price disruptor kind of aspect of it. And and that's why I didn't like the direction the company was going. And mm. at some point, one one person can't redirect the whole direction of, a, of, of hundreds of people working around a, a corporate vision. Um, who knows? I mean, I'm curious to see what he does next. He definitely is someone who changed who changed the landscape. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we, you know, when when OnePlus came on board, I think it took it took us several you know weeks or months to wrap our head around what is this exactly and what are they doing and you know and then <laughs> right. it, you know it wasn't until Gina Trapani uh, switched to the OnePlus I think it was yeah. the OnePlus One I was and that's when I took it seriously like someone who I trusted was like hey I'm going to give it a shot and I you know I spent a year and a half with OnePlus phones and I loved them I thought they were great um, I didn't okay. mention at the top of the show not to th- go away from OnePlus but I did get my uh, Pixel 4a. Uh, nice. A couple of days ago, so I've been and speaking of OnePlus, comparing it to the my OnePlus mm-hmm. uh, Seven Pro, uh, it Sweet is. I, I, I feel I feel like Jason holding this phone in my hand because it's like I just feel like it's an, I'm enormous and the phone is tiny, um, but I'm liking it so far. So uh, more when next week we'll talk more. I'll do, I'll do a little kind of hands on with the Pixel Four A. I know I'm the last person in the world to get it, but still, uh, it's uh, my first my first very own. Uh, out of the gate pixel. So I'm excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very positive on 4A. It, it, it's really helping to shake up that conversation. And and like we're, we've been talking internationally with phones like the Nord of just how pleasant an experience it is at sub $400 prices. And it's really reinforcing, especially in light of the recent economic news <laughs> around the yep. world, um, mm-hmm. h- how how refreshing it is to have an option there where you don't feel like you're getting punished for software updates. You don't feel like you're getting punished for camera performance. It has a headphone jack, which I know is your primary priority 
and having good <laughs> audio, Ron, is having a cabled connection for the best signal stability and the highest fidelity I at mean, all times. Listen, I know that's I, so critical to you. Listen, these that, uh, these Sony <laughs> earbuds that I use that I paid uh, $8.99 for, yeah. really, I want to make sure that the You're audio quality is the, the best it can be. Yeah. So. yeah I mean, I'm, I'm on my in-ear monitors, but, but with the phone I've been spending time with, it's almost like we were role reversal because I'm on Pixel Buds now where I'm yeah. doing the wireless thing while you're using a phone with a headphone jack <laughs> kind of madcap zany topsy-turvy world are we living in these days okay. everything's wow I feel I feel like this is a really good segue <laughs> into our next little news item actually speaking of headphone jacks and headphones and things of the sort I don't know if you guys heard but Apple had like a really big event today I personally wasn't around <laughs> for the event. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Apparently they announced a new phone, the iPhone 12. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple other shows here on the Twit Network where you can catch up on that news. But here we're going to actually talk about something that I'm kind of hoping will set Juan off a little bit. So let's see <laughs> if I can bait him. So <laughs> Apple says that the iPhone 12, it nixes the ear pods and the power adapter. Now, the company mm. is doing this to be a little more environmentally friendly, which we could use any of right now because, you know, climate change. Now, iPhone users will have to buy ear pods and the USB power adapter separately. I think because here, the idea is that if you're already a big Apple fan, you're already in this ecosystem, you probably have something to listen to your phone with, you probably have something to charge your phone. But, you know, I'm thinking as an Android adjacent kind of news item, how do we kind of feel about this? You know, Apple does, it does have the power to set a precedent in this industry. And so it makes me think, how is this going to set a precedent for us Android using folk uh, and the dozens of manufacturers out there that do include these accessories? Is this really an environmentally friendly move or is this just Apple being like wink, wink, nudge, nudge? Our fan base knows everything already. So if you're not in the game, too bad. Um, and Juan, I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, first. You, you picked a good one to set me off. I, I was kind of <laughs> cranky it. pants all over Twitter during during the actual keynote, during the actual, I, I don't know. See, the thing is, the, the long term on this, I'm actually very positive. I want consumers to take some ownership over things like accessories to, to just look at their own behavior. I think we yeah. can all agree that when we talk about environmental impact and waste and um, how we clean up the environment and the air, we're, we're, we really have to look at the structures of like mega corporations. But that doesn't mean that we can't contribute in some small ways down at the, the, the ground floor, at the individual user floor too. And, and especially for some of the wonderful products that are out there where, you know, you can get great chargers and, and you can kind of take some ownership over your your products and use them better and use them with, you know, just a little bit more of a, an environmentally conscious way. Um, I, I am positive. I, I, you know, put less junk in the box that I'm probably not going to like. And, and it empowers me. And, and it, you know, if I'm informed properly, I make smarter purchasing decisions that last beyond the product, the, the phone or the gadget that I'm trying to support. That's what I hope to, to have more of a conversation with. The reason why I get a little cranky when Apple makes a move like this is because mm. I, I feel some of these moves tend to be more economically cynical than the feel good marketing would indicate. Mm. I think the iPhone 12 is kind of a perfect example of this. We're going to put out this claim, but we're not really going to back the claim up. And then we're going to we're going to shift our our marketing and our uh, device sales strategy to maximize profits in a way that probably doesn't verify the claim. So the iPhone is still the only gadget that uses a lightning connector. You have mm -hmm. all of these cables, all of these chargers, all of these single feature dongles because lightning is still the USB two standard. So like yep. where I can grab a. a a laptop dock on a USB-C right. cable and plug this into a phone, you can't do all of these things on an iPhone because of the lightning connector you have to have 
$30 individual dongles for memory card readers and for uh, USB camera connectors and for headphone dongles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Apple says they're doing this for the environment and they can reduce some of the packaging waste of the phone itself, but they're not changing their strategy to be more like iPad, where all of those accessories would then get double duty, where you could plug that dongle into an mm. iPad, into a MacBook, into an iPhone. The iPhone can't do that by design of this lightning connector, which is not a standard. It's unique to the iPhone and creates waste just based on the iPhone. And then all of those accessories are going to come in additional packaging. So you saved packaging waste on the box for the phone, but then you still need to go out and buy a charger. You probably want to get an extra cable. And then they piggyback this by saying, well, you've got all these chargers out there. Well, they gave you a USB-C lightning cable in the box. And we know most of the chargers out there use USB-A. So again, their, their, their behavior to me doesn't quite gel with this feel good marketing of we're so environmentally friendly, but now you're going to want to get a mag, a mag safe wireless adapting charger, and you're going to need to get a different charge brick. You're probably going to need to get additional accessories to kind of flesh out what used and to be Apple in the Care box. And on top of it, don't forget, you could pay for Apple Care for your accessories. For and, and this is also the... <laughs> Yeah. And, and this is also the company that makes AirPods. And whether you like or dislike AirPods, um, I'd, I'd highly recommend checking out the, the folks over at iFixit. Because if you're concerned about the environment, yeah. you don't want earbuds that are completely unserviceable, are designed in a way that not only can you not fix them or replace batteries, they don't seem to be recyclable in well, any way for you to extract. They're, they're Q-tips you throw in the trash. Uh, and, and and even from Apple, because <laughs> Apple likes to make those, <laughs> Apple likes to showcase that we can take gadgets apart and re, re you know get these materials back and recycle yeah. these materials. AirPods don't seem to be recyclable to any great degree. So, you know, we can always count on as soon as Apple makes some kind of market shift like this, Samsung is going to make fun of them for six months and then copy them because <laughs> it's just more yeah. profitable <laughs> it's true. to yeah. do that. Although I will and, and we say know. I have, you know, um, over the years, I, I got this like little geometric bowl, right? And it's become my uh, earbud bowl. So whenever <laughs> before COVID times, people would come right. over and, you know, would you like an earbud for your ride home? Because I've been collecting them from all these phones. For right. Yeah. I mean, you know. because it is I mean, I don't use any of those things, but I, I, ha I, I have given away a lot of included earbuds in different cases. But it, it's frustrating because I feel like this is something that consumers should be on top of that. We should take ownership of our products and make smarter accessory purchasing decisions. But I just and, feel like when Apple yeah. does this, it's going to be a it's, ripple effect through Samsung. And then LG is going to copy Samsung because we know LG copies Samsung. But they're and all, all going to continue then, to use, you know, metals that are overmined in different like countries. They're all going to continue like, you know, it, it just the, it, the amount of it, it pollution all from all this stuff our, that is our, being. Although you know, it all goes back, I, I it give, all goes back to give, we were talking. We were talking about Steve Jobs earlier. It all goes back to the reality distortion field that he established. Yeah. <laughs> right. Bit. I mean, that's what it is. That's what it is. I mean, everyone, everyone loved the iPhone. No one loved the working conditions at Foxconn. You know, but, like but it, it is it, an opportunity. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say it is an yeah, opportunity no. to look at some of our purchasing decisions. Where I agree. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm not the biggest fan of Samsung, but a lot of Samsung earbuds are at least somewhat serviceable. Like you, you know, again, I, I love watching teardowns and I love watching people really try to They're repair really gadgets good. and, 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 you know, if we can do a better job of, uh, of, of showcasing or highlighting that, if we care about the environment, then it's on us to say, you know, Hey, maybe not AirPods, but if you look at these galaxy buds, you might actually be able to replace batteries on them. So instead of burning them out over a year and a half and having to buy new $200 earbuds, you might be able to get the batteries replaced. And that should give us, you know, uh, the evidence for making a smarter, longer term purchasing decision, which is better on our wallet yeah. and better for the environment. And that's a win win. Yeah. So so it's unfortunate because like that means we also have to kind of counteract Apple's marketing machine, which 
I, I can't. <laughs> like, I can't. I mean, not even Apple's Google's megaphone. been able to counteract that, right? And Google's got, I would argue, about yeah. the same, you know, amount of prowess there. So, I don't know. But for Apple bringing this conversation up, though, it does help us spread the word on what we think might be, you know, sort of a more reasonable or more responsible, you know, kind of tech yeah. ownership. So, so I mean, I at least need to credit them for that. But... I, I very rarely find that when Apple pulls the plug on a feature or removes a, a part of a device, that it's it's very rarely for the consumer benefit. It's it's yeah, it's, it's, it's most it's often rarely altruistic, right? Yeah, uh -huh. it, it's it's a very it, it's a very um, calculated move to make sure that they can maximize. Uh, the value added purchases of accessories at the time that someone picks up a phone, and I just. I don't have the warm feels for their marketing message on this one. While I'm very concerned about the future of e-waste, I don't see where this move is really going to make it better. And I think in many ways it will probably make the short term change a lot worse for people um, in uh, again in the short term. Well, that's fair and valid. Um, I knew and that's it would set him off, y'all. I told <laughs> good you. Good job. I told I, you. It was and a good one. I, I mean, <laughs> as, as soon as I like saw like, oh, we're going to make the packaging less. And you're like, no, because now I have to buy a charger and probably another cable. And it's more this, packaging. And that. It's more packaging. It's way yeah. more packaging. Yeah. 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 What I would love, you know, so, it, it, you know, allow us on this little Android podcast, Apple, to, to make a request. If, if this really is about reducing waste and helping the environment, Make it an initiative in your Apple stores where the products and accessories and dongles that you sell just are delivered directly, mm. where there isn't yeah. a fancy, cute little box for this dongle that I need for a USB or a memory card reader or something. And I go in and I talk to someone in, in one of your you know Apple polo shirts and they swipe a credit yeah. card on an iPhone and then they just hand me the product. And or I don't or get you get a, 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 a recycle a recyclable static bag or something like that's disposable that is yeah exactly. yeah, yeah totally give, agree totally me, agree give me a, a low impact environmentally friendly near tissue paper quality bag and yeah. let me just walk out with that product and then I'll start to take some of this commentary on protecting the environment a little bit more seriously. All right, fair big words for Juan. Um, <laughs> Apple also will hear them, I'm sure. <laughs> also, probably another good segue because if you want to avoid uh, getting an iPhone 12 or getting AirPods or anything like that, uh, today and tomorrow, you might want to head over to Amazon.com. Uh, this is their annual Prime Day, uh, which is actually two days. Um, and the, the fine folks at, at Android Police, as well as every other blog out there, have uh, compiled a bunch of lists of all the things that you can get from Amazon uh, from a low, low price. And there's a lot of stuff for us Android folks, including wireless earbuds, uh, headphones and things like that, um, as well as phones. You can get a ton of the Samsung phones. Uh, you can get the Pixel 4, Pixel 4 X. XL, you know, you get the Pixel 4 XL for 350 bucks off. That's a that's, that's mm -hmm. quite the discount on that. Mm -hmm. um, whether you want to or not, that's another question. But still, <laughs> uh, tablet tablets are on there. Chromebooks, um, you know, uh, Wi-Fi mesh network, you know, like home, you know, uh, uh, smart devices, you know, um, you know, uh, noise canceling headphones, all the stuff that you want to get, you can get an Amazon Rest Echo. White strips, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Bluetooth I speakers. I, yeah, I feel TVs. attacked. Uh. <laughs> no, I heard. I heard it was. I heard Crest White Strips are a really good deal. Twelve dollars instead of the usual whatever they are. Sixty percent off. I don't know. But anyway, if you're in the if you're in the market for something, you might want to check it out, save some money while you're at it. Uh, with their insane two day Prime Day. So there it is. Always a fun fun time to see what in the Android world is on sale. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, we're gonna pause, and we're all gonna be adults as we thank our first sponsor, because mm -hmm. uh, this episode of All About Android is brought to you by Manscaped. Uh, and hey, mirror, mirror on the wall. What's the best brand for my balls? Manscaped, of course. <laughs> but hang on now. You're getting we're all getting older. You got some nose hairs up there. Uh, good thing our partners at Manscaped are here to ensure you're taking care of your manhood and your nose hairs with their new performance package. 
Uh, and listen, I'm, I'm no spring chicken. I'm, I'm in my forties. Uh, I will say it was, um, it was probably about, I want to say 10, 15 years ago that, uh, for Christmas, my, my dear, dear older sister got me a nose hair trimmer and, uh, I did, didn't even think about it. And she just kind of nodded and I was like, Oh, right. Okay. I'm getting older. It's time to, it's time to reel those things back in. And then we all remember being in high school and making fun of that science teacher who had hair coming out of their ears or things like that. Don't be that person. All right. Uh, there are modern technology can help you to keep your grooming uh, top notch. Uh, and luckily, Manscaped is here to help us with that. Uh, Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Included in this new package is the Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, which is waterproof and uses a 9000 RPM motored 360 degree rotary dual blade system. This nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin safe technology, which helps pr- prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. Look, fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. So why not use the best tools for the job? This bundle includes the Lawn Mower 3.0 trimmer, the best trimmer on the market for your balls, butt, and body. And let's not forget their famous liquid formulations, the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner to maximize your ball hygiene routine, because that's important. Uh, And you can get the performance package now to receive their two free gifts, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Also, you'll receive a replaceable blade every three months to keep your weed whacking and lawn mowing time clean and enjoyable. The performance package is the best value that Manscaped has to offer. Thank you, Manscaped, for making our holes look sexy. So you can get 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com slash twit. That's 20% off plus free shipping at manscaped.com slash twit. Manscaped.com slash twit. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weeds and, and, and get all cleaned up for the world when you're stuck at home. Thank you, Manscaped, for sponsoring this episode of All of an Android. And uh, that is a great time to go right into hardware. Wow, 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 wow. We've actually got a lot of hardware that we're going to get through today. But first, we're going to start with a nice little show and tell of the Pixel 5, which Juan has in hand to show to us. Yay! Okay, hold on. Show us your new toy. This is the Pixel 5, and it's really pretty. Okay, so wait, that's without a case. It's just... Without a case. That's a... So that blue... You got the bluish... Ishy yeah, color. It, it, it's you know I, I I keep wanting to say it's like kind of like um like a like a tea colored or a a, a nice kind of, it's not quite like a turquoise but it, it really is nice. I, I make fun of a lot of reviewers. It's like oh it feels really nice in the hand. Like that's kind of some kind of really insightful gadget review commentary. But it's, it's, it it's called hand feel. It's called hand feel. Juan, what's the hand feel? <laughs> But it's, you know, like, yeah, you know, I think we've been a ways from phones that like, you know, oh, no, this is like sharp edges and it hurts my evolved primate grip. Like, I feel like we've kind of gotten over that, but it's been really refreshing playing with a phone that's not a glass on glass or a shiny plastic trying to look like glass kind of phone. Um, it kind of takes you back where we used to have more material competition for th- what our devices were made out of. But yeah, it's a cute little little phone. And um, I, I got to say, I'm still under kind of an odd embargo where uh, the Team Pixel crew, the hashtag gift from Google people, um, it, it, like uh, w- we can't really talk about like the deep dive performancey stuff. Like I can show you the home screen and I can I can like kind of talk about the build and show you the the phone and how much I love having I a mean, rear Ron fingerprint and I sensor again. Even- like but. seen this beyond oh, wow. kind of some press okay. renders and so okay, well, I, I just want to see it. <laughs> let, let, me me, let me see if I can give you guys a, a better angle on this. If you'll pardon my absolutely terribly messy desk. I, I'm not sure if this will this will work super well. My lights. Oh, we do this every thing, week on but. the show now because I I just switched input. Jason has a fancy mixer now, which I really should maybe think about doing that. But. <laughs> and we want to apologize to our audio listeners for talking about what the video shot looks like. Yes, we apologize, but, yeah, audio it, listeners. Right now we're uh, switching Juan's video. He's trying to get it set up so that we can. Oh, did, all right. There it? we go. Hey, Jeez, look at that. It actually really kind of works. So 
So this is the Pixel 5, and it's nearly the same dimensions, Ron, as uh, your Pixel 4a. I, I don't know Ron where my Pixel Ron is handling it right now is. in front of his desk. He's showing us the back. It's got this really nice blue. The the G on the back is, you know, towards the bottom, kind of where we're used to seeing that on the Pixel devices. What color mm -hmm. is that one? I, I forget what they call it. You know, Google always has those cute color names. Well, like, what, what is the color of the G? Is that like the same blue? Oh, no, it, is it a, a black? No, no, no. It's, it's a sort of a silver reflective. I'm just trying okay. to catch it in the light of my... Uh, of my studio lights here, but okay. you know, it, it's taking a lot of what I like about pixel 4a. And, and I mean, until this iPhone 12 announcement, um, I feel like this was, this is probably one of the smaller 5g enabled phones that people can shop. I know. That's, um, yeah, that's I, good I, I don't know about, know. yeah, I mean, for your, from your commentary or, or people that have been, you know, kind of you know, responding to your show, I feel like, We've gotten all of these monster, huge, big, chunky, chunk phones for 5G to handle the extra battery draw for all the extra antennas. And it's kind of, again, there are just so many things about this where it's refreshing to have another option, a little bit more competition um, in a way that yeah, you, you kind of want to have at least another option that you can recommend to people when uh, when they're out shopping a phone. Um, I know my dad. The... Sorry. Oh, go ahead. I'm I'm sorry. I thought. Uh, listen, sometimes I'm bad with my transitions. I was just going to bring up the stovetop camera on the back and say oh, that sure. that's still, you know. So uh, uh, you want to remind us real quick what hardware is there in that little camera section? Of course. So we've got a 12 megapixel uh, main uh, wide shooter, and then another uh, a 12 megapixel ultra wide. So instead of going with the telephoto, like the pixel four had, right. uh, they're going ultra wide. I, I, I've been generally fine. Um, I, I, my preferred camera is having the ultra wide. I, I know we've got all these like super fancy space zooms and stuff, but I don't need I, it. I don't know. Yeah, for I reach, get a telescope. I, if I want to look at Saturn, I'll get a telescope. Okay. <laughs> it's fine. But, 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 but don't you find like, you know, your image integrity falls apart pretty quickly yeah. and especially in sort of mixed lighting or lower lighting conditions. It just seems to kind of be better cropping from the main sensor anyway. Um, one of the things that I'll be I'll, I'll, I'll be excited to show, which I can't really show right now, but in the coming days when this embargo lifts uh, is this is a 765, a Snapdragon 765. And this is one of the only phones that I know of with the 765 that can shoot 4K at 60 frames per second. So it definitely seems like over last year where the, the main focus was still photography and uh, using a tripod for astrophotography that Google is kind of circling back to some of the criticisms people had about improving the video quality on pixels. And um, I, I think from the Pixel 4a to, to here, it's definitely a step up. Like I've been shooting vlogs on the Pixel 4a and the 30 frame per second 4K looks phenomenal. Dang. So I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm really excited to be playing with the uh, Pixel 5 for something similar. But more than anything else, it's just kind of nice to have an option here where we're um, you know, I, I know there's going to be a, a an Android commentary where because a Galaxy S20 FE exists, no one should buy anything else. Um, but I want options. I want a little Roadster phone. I want a big, heavy diesel truck phone. I want, you know, different solutions for different consumers. And mm -hmm. I still feel like Google is making one of the best plays for software services and communicator yeah. devices. And if, if you're wanting that streamlined approach, you're not looking to replace a laptop with your phone, then I need a good option to recommend for that kind of consumer. Well, I want to move on to another couple of little options. So thank you, Juan, for yeah. bringing the Pixel 5 to show and tell. I finally get to see one in person-ish. It's pretty. Yeah, well, maybe maybe someday I'll see it in person for real, for real. <laughs> but until then, I really want to talk a little bit about some of the Sony phones that you recently reviewed. Because I saw yeah. you're one of the few people that actually covered these phones kind of in a, in a way that I knew that they were being covered, to be honest with you. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about the Sony Xperia 5 II and the Sony Xperia 1 II. Um, 
We're going to do a little more show and tell. Juan is still has his camera set up so that we can kind of look at them. But Juan, I would love for you to just kind of walk us through these two phones, just some of the highlights of them that you found while you're reviewing them, because we get a lot of questions about Sony phones, but we don't always have a lot of things to say about it, either because the phones aren't really available in the U.S., Mm -hmm. Or it's just something gets announced and then it kind of falls and, you know, by the wayside. So I don't know. You want to talk a little bit about your experience with these two phones? Um, Absolutely. What we can so sort of, um, yeah. unfortunately, I, I, I just had to send the uh, the Xperia 5 to That's okay. back. So this is the Xperia 1 Mark II. Um, this is one of uh, my that's favorite how you say phones. It. I totally butchered that. <laughs> I, I mean, there's there's no right way, but I kind of feel like one Mark II. And you start saying Mark II, and it kind of sounds like you're talking about Iron Man armor. I, I well, really for feel me, like I think I'm talking about a Canon SLR. Like for me, it can be very exactly to, you're like a yeah. Sony Alpha, and and it right. is ex exceptionally clear that Sony is, uh, it, this is going to be tough. Um, there's such a mirror finish on the phone that my camera, my poor Panasonic probably won't be able to focus was, on this very um, well. Or did I write, is this the one with the quad or this is the triple, you know, this is the, the quad camera is the Xperia one Mark two, correct? That's right. So we've got three main camera sensors, um, for photography. And then there's also a time of flight, a depth tracking sensor, um, there we go. On, Burke's on zooming that. in Ooh, for those watching that. the video you feed. Can so get the Zeiss it, label on that. Good job. It Burke. looks like a long pill with four yeah. sensors plugged in there, plus two other sensors on top of the pill area. Are those, yeah, are those these just are, flashes? This is, yeah, this is a flash, and this is, I think, a, a light detection or something that that kind of helps for metering. No. Sony Sony phones are the most camera like. So when I'm, I'm messing up my camera autofocus. All right. So, so when it. you're handling a Sony, it is just abundantly clear that they are working with the alpha team at Sony very yeah. close. Um, the Xperia team is no longer, I think, flying completely solo. And there have even been a few more conversations with Sony PR where they're bringing up things like PlayStation support and how you connect it to a right. DualShock, you know, a PlayStation controller. Well, that's a big deal now, right? I mean, we've got Xbox integration on some Android phones. We've got Stadia, mm -hmm. which is supposed to become a thing somehow. But the idea is there in the ether that this is this is something. Oh, absolutely. It's that's going to be pushed on us to kind of adopt. And so for, for uh, a certain phone company announcing today that they're bringing out a phone with flat and angular sides, I mean, I feel like Sony kind of beat them to the punch. And then they talked about how you're going to get 4K video. And I feel like right. Sony kind of beat them to the punch. And it all comes down to some of the absolute best uh, photography interfaces whoa, I think you whoa, can find. Whoa. Is that the camera so. UI, the stock camera UI that we're looking at right now? So there are now three apps on a Sony. This is the Photo Ooh. Pro app, and okay. and it really is. I mean, there's no shutter button on the screen. You hold it like a little rangefinder, where the shutter, the dedicated shutter button on the side so of like the phone is how you actually yeah. take the photo, and it's absolutely wonderful. There's never that opportunity that that moment where. Uh, come on, I'm trying to get the camera to focus. There's never that moment where you know you're trying to do something on like a Samsung or an LG, and you accidentally swipe. And it shifts you from like photos oh, to video, that, yeah. something really annoying. These Sony's now are just so hyper focused on on getting that kind of photography done. Um, it, it really is a joy to shoot with, and it, and it really does feel like you are shooting on a Sony Alpha. It's immediately familiar if you've ever used one of their cameras. So I know a lot of people hmm. say like, oh well, you know, it's not very good for auto modes, but their metering and their exposure adjustments are as straightforward and as simple as they can get. Like I'm in program mode here, just like you would have the dial on a regular camera. And if you want to go full green box auto mode, you can. Um, so it, it's, in terms if you've ever of, handled a camera, you know what this is going to do. In terms of shooting, you know, again, we talk about the auto mode on the pixel. It's very like one, two point and shoot, you get the photo that you want as long as it's in focus. Mm -hmm. My experience with Sony phones of the past were that the camera hardware would be there, but the software just wasn't giving me what I wanted. Yeah. So are we getting actual results from having all of these lenses piped into this, this phone? Like, is this something that somebody would want to consider over a pixel device? 
So, I mean, I am immediately going to going to sort of piggyback on that idea where a Sony phone is the least familiar. If you're if you're okay. comfortable with how an iPhone or a Pixel works, you're going to pick up a Sony and it's not going to feel like anything else that you've been used to. Uh, mm -hmm. So the Xperia camera app is very much what you're describing um, in the Xperia camera app. It's kind of an uh, you are removed from the decision making process, full auto kind of situation. And, you know, you might even tap to focus and the phone will just say, no, that's not where you want to focus. You want to focus over here instead and kind of just take that out of your control. Uh, the video in the Xperia camera app is full. I mean, again, it's about as, as full auto as you can make that video. What's interesting is then when you go into Photo Pro or Cinema Pro, you have the exact opposite. You have the, like the most complete collection of uh, controls and of metering and of information getting fed back to you. So you kind of you kind of have bookends. You kind of have bookends where you don't really get to fight the Sony Xperia app. But then if you want to have the best uh, sort of look over your composition, then you come to the Cinema Pro and the Photo Pro. And I haven't even shown you guys the Cinema Pro yet. It's a it's a separate look here where you get this cinema wide crop. It's shooting HDR. You can shoot 60 frames per second. You can even That's control a busy the rack interface. Focus. That looks like a professional app. Oh, yeah. Like something that it's, I would need time to learn. It, it's totally built on like Sony um, Sony uh, Venice cameras. But like right here, what I'm showing is you can kind of preset a rack focus where you can move from one focus point to the other. And it'll automatically just sort of slide through wow. and, and you can set up a very cinematic pull, a focus pull, just like you would on a professional grade camera. Can and it's those little considerations. Red? It's Sorry. really, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it is, it, you know, it, there's literally nothing like shooting on a Sony, but that also means you kind of need to treat it like a camera and give it just that extra, um, that extra window to become more familiar. Uh, the, the rest of this is, is wonderfully simple, sort of stock Android. It's the tallest, skinniest screen that you can get. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a UHD resolution display with a, it's got this kind of uh, motion smoothing trick where black frame insertion mm -hmm. tries to smooth out um, how, uh, how you interact with the device. It's just, it's just really pretty, very unique and, I'm, 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 it's an expensive phone. I'm not trying to say like, oh, well, if you're out there shopping, in Dallas, you switch it. Uh, depending on retailer, it's twelve to thirteen hundred um, in the United States. So oh, it's wow. pricey, but it's also one of the most complete options. Wireless charging. It has a headphone jack for Ron. Um, it's uh, <laughs> it, it, you can still throw in a memory card. It, there is no more pixel dense display on any phone on the market beastly powerful with that Snapdragon 865. And then Sony absolutely leads the way for power control. So they've got adaptive mm. battery charging like a lot of other manufacturers have. This also has a feature called HS power control, heat suppression power control, where when you plug a cable in, it won't charge the battery. It'll only power the phone so your battery doesn't run hot while you're using it, kind of like a laptop. And it's like, that's a feature that should be on every phone. And currently, I believe the only other device that has something similar is an Asus. So it, it, it really is a, a very unique um, multimedia and content creation kind of experience. And if you're really looking at something that, you know, you might want to make content, you might want to like shoot or record audio or, perform, you know, produce a podcast all out of your phone, um, it's like Sony and LG are some of the best options for having that expanded list of controls. So what I'm hoping is that we'll also see some some additional uh, uh, gaming features kind of coming to their their game center. And that's more what the Xperia 5 is focusing on is having that higher refresh rate display, um, being able to uh, to kind of more fluidly play certain apps and games. And then the UI gets a lot sleeker because of that higher refresh rate screen. But Sony's making some really strong arguments for an alternative device to what we've kind of accepted as sort of core stock Android. 
Wow. Um, Juan, I really appreciate you walking us through this enormous just phone. It's enormous package, I should say, because it, it just has so <laughs> much bundled in there. Um, now, I'm very curious, you know, before we sort of move on from Sony, kind of the big, again, the big question that I've always had is who is buying these phones and where and where are they? Um, can you answer <laughs> that question for us? Well, I mean, I just wanted to say real quick, you know, in terms of saying something's enormous, it, it's uh, actually just a little bit skinnier than our, our cute little pixel. Oh, so that's very big, it's very long, though. It's very tall. So, I mean, you can see yeah. again, I'm, 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 my pixel is about to slide out and, and crash on the floor. Um, so you can see just how much that. taller it is. But <laughs> your my, my hobbit thumb ability to reach the, the edges of the display um, it does not feel anywhere near as chunky as like a Note or a V60 or any of the other bigger, bigger screen devices. Um, yeah, Sony's are, are currently only unlocked in North America. So my, my go-to for shopping them is B&H. Uh, B&H is, I think, one of the most consistent carriers. They've been showing up more frequently on Amazon this year. Um, last year, they they took a while to get to Amazon. Um, but it, you you shop them out. I don't know exactly what carrier support these might have. I'm on T-Mobile, and they seem to play just fine on T-Mobile. I think the big bummer for someone considering an alt phone like a Sony is – because they don't play as hard with the North American carrier market, the Xperia 1 and 5 Mark II currently don't support United States 5G. Mm. So these will be LTE only devices in North America. In other regions in the EU, they're going to be 5G ready. It's just our 5G rollout is kind of a mess. Um, and it doesn't seem like Sony wants to play ball with that right now. You can get them at Best. You can get them at Best Buy too. I've seen them for sale in stores at Best Buy. I, I mean, like that. I, I, the The question I have is that, like, so they're available. I just don't know why I don't see them on the subway more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, I, I think um, Sony is uh, is is definitely in a situation not unlike some of the other. Um, I'm going to switch back to my main camera here. Yeah, um, Sony's in do. a situation where I, you know, they're they're. I, I kind of feel like they're in a in a holding pattern. We look at companies like LG, where two years ago there was very little, almost no marketing. There was almost yeah. no, I mean, it was all just like YouTube and word of mouth. And this year for Sony felt like they were starting to pivot out of that. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily reaching out to like tech YouTubers, but there was a whole photography conversation happening online, and starting to see Sony kind of pick up and and make smarter uh, sort of pairings. You know, if you if you shoot on Sony Alpha cameras, I went to a, a, a photography demonstration that was hosted by Sony, and they actually had workshops talking about the first Xperia One, mm -hmm. and how people were using them for short films. And you know, like, so I, I feel like it's, it's very bottom up. It's very grassroots. It's, you know, they're rebuilding from those dark days where everyone was kind of decimated by the Snapdragon 810, you know, it tanked HTC, it tanked LG, it tanked those Sony Z's and XZ phones. Um, yep. their recovery has been very slow and kind of meandering, but Sony's ability to execute better internal collaboration with these departments is delivering, I think, one of the most interesting phones of the year. I, this, is, this is one of my favorite devices of this year. Um, but I would also, my, my recommendation for it is a little bit more reserved. You know, it's if you're a certain type of media or content creator, or you really like watching cinematic content on a juicy OLED, um, I'm, I'm not trying to make it sound like a 1200 or $1,300 phone is like, oh yeah, you just go grab one of those B&H and you're going to be great. Um, but I really like having this as a solution where not a lot of attention is being played to that kind of, uh, pocket computer. Wow. Juan, thank you so much for walking us through those two phones. Um, this is this is a good time. It, it really is Techtober, as they say. Lots of new stuff to really like sink our teeth into, and um, and just think about where we're gonna put our money going forward, right? Yeah. Yep. Well, and it's good to have some some options, you know, like. Uh, you know, th there's there's sort of a general coverage for Samsung or for Apple, and I don't feel like that general conversation always completely answers the question for someone who might have 
more niche or specific concerns for what they're trying to accomplish. And, uh, you know, that's where a folding phone or a dual screen phone or some type of stylus enabled phone or a very heavy traditional camera centric device can kind of help someone hone in, you know, just sort of narrow down something that might be a better fit for them. I mean, they're absolutely niche players just because of the realities of this market, but we should have good options in those niche categories. We will sure. take a break now and thank our next sponsor. Uh, this episode of All About Android is brought to you by our friends over at LastPass. Uh, LastPass has made a commitment to protecting its users for the last 12 years. And now with 25 million users and 70,000 businesses, it's no surprise why they are the award-winning number one password manager. Uh, living in a remote work environment has greatly impacted identity and access management for businesses and adjusting to an online workforce hasn't been a logistical problem. It's also been a security issue. Uh, LastPass has been a saving grace to many companies. One in particular leveraged LastPass to enable the team to set up, utilize, and share strong passwords for their accounts and programs. Not only was this a crucial and progressive step towards improved data security, but it helped ease the burden of the shift to working from home full time. And trust me, I, I feel that burden. It has been it has been a tough one, and luckily LastPass makes it a little easier to to uh, to jump that divide between going in the office every day and working from home. Um, and if you haven't used them yet, now's the time for your business to get LastPass. Uh, they help you transition your remote workforce, so they'll help you out. Single sign-on manages employee access in a centralized view, so IT always has insight into who has access to what from where. Enterprise password management ensures oversight of shadow IT and enforceable policies across all password-protected accounts. Multi-factor authentication requires additional factors to prove a user's identity, while the use of biometric and contextual factors makes the process smooth for employees. Their zero-knowledge security model protects everyone from their individual user to the biggest organization that uses LastPass. Your security is their top priority. And they allow employees to go passwordless and access to the tools they need to work. LastPass uses AES 256-bit encryption with PBKDF2 SHA-256 and salted hashes to ensure complete security in the cloud. Data is encrypted and decrypted at the device level, so the data in your vault is a secret from everyone, even LastPass. And that's something that we've learned from over the years, that you want to have your uh, encryption happening on the device level. It's not up in the cloud. It's not shared. It's not accessible. It's just secure in your device, in your hand. And, you know, we we use LastPass here at Twit. We love it. Um, longtime listeners of the show know that it was years ago that Jason turned me on to LastPass, and now I cannot live without it. I've got my family on it. Uh, everyone's managing their passwords through their password manager. And just the other day, I had an old account that I needed to get into that I couldn't remember what the password was. Boom, it was in my vault in LastPass. I was able to access access it on my phone, was able to jump over my laptop and, and use the Chrome extension. LastPass has just seamlessly fit into my life, and I can't imagine it without it. So I uh, strongly encourage you to check it out as well. Um, LastPass has won eight awards so far this year. They are PC Mag's editor choice. They won the Fortress Cybersecurity Award, and they are Business Insider's best overall password manager, just to name a few. You don't have to take our word for it. LastPass speaks for itself. There's no better time to get LastPass. Ease the burden for yourself and your remote workforce with the cybersecurity protection you need. Go to lastpass.com slash twit. That's lastpass.com slash twit. And we thank them for keeping our password secure and helping us work easier in this remote environment. Thanks, LastPass. You know, moving on from here, we do have one more little piece of hardware that we want to cover. So, uh, Burke, yeah. I don't know if you've got the uh, little B-roll to go through for the, the hardware. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> I love it. You hear the melody? And then, you know, he's supposed to have a little watch. Um, so, one, you've got the Tick Watch Pro 3, which mm -hmm. this is a very, this is kind of a silent winner among the Android wearables crowd. So I just kind of want to hear, you know, what your experience has been like with it. Oh, boy, that's really big, by the way. Um, how big is that screen? Yeah, it's a little bit bigger. Um, um, I don't. I think it's like a the the casing is described as being like forty six by forty seven wow, millimeters. Wow, that's big. <laughs> but you also have to take into account that I have Hobbit hands, so this is gonna <laughs> look a little bit bigger on me than like if Jason were wearing. Uh, a, a watch like this. Um, I am a big fan of Mobvoi. Uh, the Tick watches have been these sort of like 
quieter competitors in the Wear OS space. I mean, if, if we're talking Wear OS, it's it's very likely that Fossil Group is going to take the majority of the conversation there. In the smartwatch space, obviously, it's like Apple Watch and then Samsung Gears and then everyone else, you know, if we're not just looking at fitness trackers. Um, but with the uh, with the Tick Watch Pro 3, this is the Tick Watch Pro 3 GPS. So this is their Wi-Fi Bluetooth only uh, Tick Watch. They're continuing this dual display which, I mean, again, we're showing this on camera right now. And if you were a fan of wearables like the Pebble back in the day, mm -hmm. this is the solution for improving battery life. Um, I legit get around three days, three days and two nights, not three full, you know, three full days and nights, but three days and two nights of actually using the watch, uh, you know, replying to all my notifications that I can from the watch, fitness tracking from the watch, sleep tracking from the watch, and I'm not charging it as a smartwatch. So I, I don't know that there's any great power savings. This also has that new Snapdragon Wear 4100 chip um, from Qualcomm, but I feel like the bigger benefit comes from having a, a, a low power always on display that you can always you can always see. Um, I'm trying to I can kind see of get that. the right yep. end. I, there. I can see it. I, <laughs> I, I mean, I like it on you. It looks good aesthetically. Um, it looks like a really nice watch. I mean, I come from the Samsung Galaxy active family, I guess you would say. And that's a very mm -hmm. small watch in comparison. I like it that way. But I know that these watches are very popular. And I, I really have to know, like, what is it, Juan, that makes them so popular among the Android crowd? Well, I, I feel like Mavoy does not get enough credit for being one of the biggest influencers of Wear OS. So mm. when um, when Google <laughs> started enough. moving... <laughs> When, when, well, I mean, again, we also know Wear OS is like this distant third place. Um, That's why I'm Watch OS. a little bit. <laughs> but, but, you know, when we started doing this sort of four directional swipe, that was actually a major UI feature on the original Tick Watch. They had a custom skin on their watches that enabled um, this type of uh, directional navigation. And so now with the, the Wear 4100, everything's kind of just been spruced up a little bit. Everything's just a little sleeker, a little faster. And I'm hoping that this is going to be the platform that I can test uh, the, the, the promised Wear OS update. Google put out that blog post saying, hey, we're really going to try and improve performance on Wear OS. Now we've got a more powerful device um, with better battery life. It's got a bigger battery. It's got a higher resolution uh, screen. Uh, the OLED is a higher resolution OLED. Um, and it's about $100 cheaper than a Wi-Fi only Apple Watch. So mm. we've got blood oxygen if you want to test blood oxygen. Yep, uh, we yep. don't have an, e, uh, an ECG. So if that was a feature you were interested in, we don't have ECG. But we've got all day heart rate tracking, all day fitness tracking. It will automatically kick over if it detects that you're starting a workout. Uh, all kinds of different profiles and presets for workouts. And Wear OS has started to improve their compatibility with things like blood sugar monitoring tech and diabetes tech and health tech. There's still a ways to go to catch up to, to Apple um, for that kind of stuff. But it's a positive sign. It's a positive sign for a platform that I think has been um, I'm trying to do this while looking at my camera screen and it's not working. Um, it's a positive sign for something that I feel like Google hasn't been paying attention to like they should have. Um, that now we're starting to get some improvements and uh, it's starting to look uh, a little bit better for Google having their own wearable uh, in this space. Um, quick question, and this kind of comes from the chat, but I think it will really resonate with anybody. So in terms of like upgrading, if you were a person maybe with a Gear S3 or maybe like an older Wear OS watch, would you would you consider this an upgrade? Um, who's kind of the target person that would want to check this out? I really hope that people can hold on to watches for longer periods of time. I actually still have like some of those old Android Wear watches that just as mm -hmm. simple notification machines, like they still mm. work pretty well. Like my first generation Asus Zen watch is still kind of wow. nice. Like Bless it still, still kind of works. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm really not the person to be saying like, Hey, if you've got this, this 
one uh, this one product or this this one watch. Jump on the upgrade. It's it's two years old now. Oh, how could you use something that's that's months and months old? Um, what 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 I kind of look at here is uh, based on your needs, something like a fitness tracker is going to cover a good chunk of the wearable community. Um, if it's tracking your workouts and it can kind of give you some passive notification alerts, something I'm the type of person where I hate referencing my phone to check alerts and notifications. And most of those alerts and notifications I should be able to clear without pulling my phone out of my pocket. And that's where this starts to make a lot more sense at that 300 ish kind of price tier. It's not an impulse buy. It's not a casual just for funsies accessory. You kind of want to look at whether or not that fits into a, a workflow or a, you know, sort of a lifestyle that makes sense for you. But I, I, I feel like for, for the, the sort of negative sentiment or the, the feels that people have about Wear OS, um, having more power on your wrist, having a more powerful chip and having better battery life at the same time makes this a really interesting competitor against something like a Samsung. Um, I, I feel like Mavoy is, is in a unique position to offer up probably the premier, the premium tech experience for Wear OS. And now it's up to Google to kind of get developers making more applets and to, uh, to deliver some of these promised um, operating system updates. I, I like the optimism that you have that that that, that <laughs> might happen because I, I'm not holding my breath because then the watch will nag me to breathe um, <laughs> nice. it'll my blood oxygen. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's if if Google is going to put out blog posts saying, hey, we're going to do this. OK, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very anxious. I'm I'm there. I really want to see them improve their wearable strategy because I kind of feel like we're missing that last linchpin of ecosystem. Like I've got these Pixel Buds that have great Google Assistant integration. These are things that I wear. So why not include Wear OS into an ecosystem of products? One of the last times I came on the show, I was talking about Focals by North and Google bought yep. Focals by North. So why doesn't Wear OS mean operating system for something that I wear on my face, something that I wear on my shoes, something that I wear in my ears. So even if it's just a baby step, like we're going to improve the smartwatch operating system, that's great. But I really want to see Google start tying these pieces together because they might be one of the only companies with all of those pieces now. I just want to see them execute on something a bit more holistically. It's a fair, fair point. Yeah, I, I, I'm just not optimistic it'll happen. So, um, well, yeah, the, it's a cool the watch. update is is already out for one watch. I just don't know what what the uh, the longer support is going to be. So if you've got something like an Aware 2100, I'm not sure what watches and manufacturers are going to be getting support back that far. I would imagine that the Fossil Group is probably going to keep up with the Wear 3100 watches, but this is brand new. <laughs> like this is the yeah. new tick watch. So if if we don't get the at least the Android 11 update for this, then I kind of feel like torches and pitchforks are totally warranted. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I want to see Google do this right because you know wearable tech is something that we're going to be doing way more of. So why not have some good solutions and some good competition in that space? They just seem to slow play it, and they've not been super competitive over the last couple of years. Yeah. Oh, wearables! It is a it is a strange uh, vertical within the hardware space. So, uh, mm -hmm. well, cool. That was that was awesome. Thanks for sharing, Juan. And with that, let's dive into some apps. Coming this winter, the All About Android Vaporwave album. JK. Um, so as part of the new shift over to Google TV, it's time for us to now say goodbye to Google Play Movies and TV, the app. So earlier this year, we helped you get away, say goodbye to Google Play Music, maybe kind of. Now we have to say goodbye to Google Play Movies and TV. But it's being completely rebranded as Google TV. Some of you may have noticed the icon already on your home screen. I did the other day and I just like turned on um, the LG Velvet and it was on there. This is not my daily driver, but it it was there waiting for me. 
Now, a couple of things just to sort of keep in mind about this new app is that the interface you see on it is going to be very familiar to the Google TV interface that's coming through. So you have um, four you recommendations put front and center, whatever you've got going on HBO Max. If you're a subscriber, um, if Google knows you've watched Disney Plus, it will suggest things through that app. Um, if you know maybe you've got a Hulu account you've logged into before, you'll have suggestions for that on the screen. Um, there will also be top picks based on genres that you've partaken in before. So right now, some of my top picks include Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Yes, that's on par. Uh, Grey's Anatomy. Definitely something I maybe would have been into like 13 years ago, maybe a little 13 years <laughs> too late, but you know, uh, Chernobyl. Absolutely. I would love to watch Chernobyl, but I'm oh, not going to so do good. that. It was I know, so good. I, it was so good. I don't know good. if I can handle that kind of content right now. Just It was really it. good. It was um, really good. I also find it very interesting. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went into the HBO app and I was like faving some movies that I want to show Mona. So Anastasia, the animated movie, is here on my suggestions list, which I think is kind of nice. Uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Interesting. Nice. Interesting. Um, you know, it's uh, basically trying to emulate what you have going on with Google TV. Again, I talked about a lot how the new interface is very centered on giving suggestions of content to watch rather than just here are the apps that you've had installed on your Google TV. The app is a very similar idea. Now I'm going to try something. So this suggested to me to pop into Anastasia. So I'm just going to tap on it and see what it does. So what it does is it takes you to the page. You have the Rotten Tomatoes listing there. Uh, very standard kind of this is, you know, here are the ratings. Now you can choose where to watch it. Do you want to add it to your watch list? I'm going to add it to my watch list. Why the heck not? Now I can choose whether I want to watch it at HBO or whether I want to watch it here on Google TV and rent it the way that I would have previously on play movies and TV. So you'll still be able to rent in HD or SD uh, based on what you want to watch, or the app will point you to the service where you can watch this if you already pay for it. A little annoying is the fact that there are suggestions for things like Disney Plus, which I'm not paying for right now. Um, so I can go in and it'll tell me I can watch the right stuff at Disney Plus and how many episodes are available as well as how much I could pay monthly to get access to that. But there is instead a button to install Disney Plus. So what it'll do is I'll tap that and then uh, right within the app, it'll it'll allow me to install it. So it's kind of a nice little user-friendly way to get content without having to dig into the Play Store separately uh, from the Google TV app. Again, some of the genres that I was talking about Google TV offering to me last week when I was doing the Chromecast review, you know, we've got all my reality TV is there, romance shows. Again, that seems to be a thing that keeps getting peddled to me. Science fiction, superhero movies, uh, watch it again. I am very curious to see if, um, if I am going to be able to find new content because one thing I really liked doing was logging into play movies and TV at the end of the week, uh, especially during pandemic times. We've all been at home and seeing what I can rent. It brings me back to the days of yore. We would walk inside of a blockbuster and you'd either you'd either go to the left where all the new releases were or you'd go to the right where all the you know archive stuff were, was to kind of see if you wanted to get something from there. So I kind of like that I can get that experience in an app. Uh, and I'm glad that Google's not totally going away with that. It's well, just it's, it's, it's kind of it, it's interesting that that it's interesting because you could get this in an app, and it was in apps like Just Watch and other apps that aggregated what was playing oh, on the mm -hmm. various streaming services. Like I think it's really telling or interesting that Google is abandoning pushing their TV and movie store and rather embracing all these other streaming services. Like it's almost like the, this, I mean, this is definitely user friendly, but it's also just like, yeah, but we're not gonna push you to use us, which I feel no, is No, that's not true. I mean, I still have a tab for my library, sure. which I but own it's not quite private, a bit of sure. movies. Yeah. 
But, um, but I think this is interesting is do you think that this is Google's way of kind of end running around some of the issues that the Apple app store has had, but putting their platform on our platform, yeah. you can watch Disney Plus and you can watch Hulu and mm. you can use HBO Max. But this is Android and Google and and trying to trying to kind of position it there first without like really stepping on the toes of all of the different content distribution partners that they might be working with. Yeah, mm. that's, that's a, good a really good that's point. Very, one. Yeah. I mean, I'm because not going to stop renting movies through Google, though. I mean, that's still a preferred Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I definitely feel like this move towards Google TV is very much just a rebranding to to be in a position where it can be against Apple TV, you know, maybe mm. really go well, up against the other set-top boxes that are available. Uh, and just, yeah, think of it more as a platform. Yeah, this because is, I this thought is it was ma- interesting. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ron. I'm- I was going to say, yeah, this is this is clearly to get the Chromecast, the new Chromecast, up over the the hump of what it previously has been, um, yep. and embrace yeah. all the different ways you can watch video, not just on their own platform. So I like it. I think I'm using the app. It's on. It's it's on my home screen now. So so yeah. before. I- I Sorry, was just going to say Mom. real quick, because I always just thought it was interesting how the proto version of this were all of those weird like licensing partnerships with like movies anywhere. Uh-huh. You, know, you yep. get like a digital code from buying a Blu-ray and you it would add it I, to your catalog here and then it would show up on in your Play Store. But that to me always seemed like I, I wonder how they did that because – then, you know, there's no reason for me to use movies anywhere. It's just going to show up in my Google Play. I, I love movies. Any, I love movies anywhere because right? what it because what it did was it took all the different places where you may have bought a movie or gotten a movie for free. Honestly, mm-hmm. my movies anywhere is filled with all like the here's a free movie on us or whatever. Yep. And, and and when I've gotten digital codes from Blu-rays and things like that, it, it's a great place to enter it in. But the, the, the thing about movies anywhere is it's a rare case of the studios and the platforms all working together and plugging in to make, you know, to share data and to make it easier on the consumer, which is like, we never see that happen, right? So that's why I, feel, I always like, I love to promote movies anywhere because I feel like it's doing, it's a customer forward uh, approach mm-hmm. as opposed as opposed to the the platforms. So. Oh, for sure. But, but this, yeah. this feels so, so interesting though, that now they're not hiding where the movie's coming from. Like if it's Netflix or if it's Disney right. plus, but they're the front end. This is, this is yeah. Google. And you can watch Disney Plus on Google. And me, it, it, I just think it's it's kind of an interesting twist is that that Google is now positioning themselves ahead, whereas yeah. like the whole movies anywhere thing was just sort of seamless and it just kind of worked behind the scenes and you didn't have to like babysit it. You weren't really aware of where yeah. you got the movie from. It was just in your catalog. I just think it's an interesting turn seeing Google kind of take ownership of a platform as opposed to trying to be a one stop shop. Yeah. Yeah, no, now, it definitely is interesting. It just sort of before we close out this conversation, I'm curious with you, what you guys think about with this play branding because I see it's really being shuffled out for other things. Uh, play music, yeah. obviously, we talked about YouTube music, uh, play movies and TV. That's going the way of Google TV. So what's going to happen to our Play Store? Our App Store? I, I mean, so, so what's left is play books and play games. Right. Those yeah. are the, the holdouts now. And then um, and, and play I, I can't games isn't really to me, you know, it's felt like kind of the game center <laughs> approach. It's just kind of where everything is right. aggregated, things you've been playing, that sort of thing. It's not really a, a platform. To so consider, so, I, so. I, I don't know about publishing, but I'll be very surprised if over the next year what what play games represents isn't rolled into something like Stadia. Um, oh, well. yeah. And so, so okay, now you, that's a good, yeah. The the one that I'm not sure is is what do you do with periodicals and with ebooks, um, where I have to believe like Amazon is the dominant force in that. So, does Google do something similar where they work with Amazon for your Kindle library to be also a front end on a Google service with ebooks, much like Google TV is doing? Because they don't have. I mean, Chromecast is a vested interest in having a video streaming solution in place. Ebooks, not not as precious, no. I feel, for what Agreed. Google's trying to do. So I kind of feel like 
you know, that's probably going to be the one that's going to hold out the longest just while Google figures out what to do with it. It better because yeah. I have a giant library on there, uh, both of things I've <laughs> uploaded to my account and things I've purchased. Oh, and I would right, like right, for right. that, yeah. you know. Well, they're, yeah, they're very I, good I, about I letting you download things. download your library and figure out a way to transfer it and all that stuff. So sure. I'm sure when they decide, they'll figure it out. But um, sure, anyway, you. moving on. Um, real quick note, uh, our favorite podcast player app uh, here at All About Android is Pocket Casts, and they just rolled out an interesting bit of new functionality uh, that I thought was really interesting uh, that I've never – I you wonder why hasn't anyone done this yet. But uh, with the new version of Pocket Casts, you can now sort – uh, your podcast that you listen to by length as it relates to your commute time. So if you have a 30 that, minute commute, you can say sort all my podcasts by episodes that are 30 minutes or less. That is so what, cool. Isn't I it? Isn't that, that so cool? So much. Yeah. Yeah, very smart, and glad to see the the gang over Pocket Cast doing smart things for podcasts. Um, unfortunately, this show would not appear in a thirty minute or less commute. But uh, mm -hmm. all of you who are driving two hours, we salute you. So bless you, <laughs> bless you, bless you, bless you. Uh, very quickly before we go to our next ad, uh, just a quick little update on the recorder app for Pixel phones. It now lets you edit by transcription, so this is nice and helpful. If you need to edit a transcription, you no longer have to go through the waveform and just kind of like slide around and be like, where's that place that I want to edit it? No, instead all you have to do is you go in and you highlight the portion of the transcription that you need to kind of, you know, clip out and the app will do it for you. So something very fun to just kind of like look forward to. This update is rolling out right now. So if you don't have it quite yet in your pixel, don't fret. You can sideload it though. Uh, XDA developers, I believe, has a APK rolling around and um, I'm sure APK Mirror does as well. So if that's something that you want to push through, go and have yourself some transcribing fun. I know I will. Woo. I need all the help I can get. I can't afford an intern. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fun times. Uh, now let's thank our th last sponsor of the evening. We want to thank ZipRecruiter for sponsoring this episode of All About Android. And listen, there's a lot to think about these days as an employer, and hiring can be challenging, especially when you have to think about enforcing social dis distancing and supplying masks and making sure your work environment is safe and all that stuff. There's a lot to do. Uh, Monica Starks could relate. She needed to hire for a pivotal role at her construction company, GS Group, but was having a tough time finding the right person with so many candidates out there. So she switched to ZipRecruiter because they make hiring easy. ZipRecruiter's technology identifies people with the right experience for your job and actively invites them to apply, which is why you should try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Android. And that's how Monica found Lamont Jenkins. She said that ZipRecruiter sent Lamont's pro profile to her around five minutes after she posted her job because he was a great match for the role. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. That's insane, everyone. If you've ever, if you've ever been hiring for somebody, that, that those kind of results are just nuts. It's fantastic. Uh, ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job sites, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. ZipRecruiter makes the entire hiring process, process efficient and effective with features like screening questions to filter candidates and an all-in-one dashboard where you can review and rate your candidates. See for yourself. Try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Android. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash A-N-D-R-O-I-D. ZipRecruiter.com slash Android. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Thanks, ZipRecruiter. You're awesome. Very smart ways to hire. Cool. So, Flo, uh, we got some emails from, from the audience, from the community. Email. So we've got this. That was my Homestar Runner impression, by the way. Uh, 18 years nice. later. Nice. Uh, so our first email comes from uh, Peter Keefe, and I think this is a very important uh, and timely question to come through. So Peter writes in, I'm trying to decide between the new Chromecast of Google TV and the NVIDIA Shield. In addition to streaming, I'd like to be able to host my local movie collection. Do you know if it's possible to add external storage to the new Chromecast and make it to and make it a Plex server? Now, I got to say, Peter, I don't know specifically about making it specifically a Plex server. I do know that there is that dongle that lets you turn it into uh, actually the Ethernet dongle is separate from what I'm referring to. 
You could get a separate USB-C dongle and try and add on storage that way. But uh, I will say I think you're better off just having a separate Plex server in the house and then just downloading the app on the Google TV, uh, the Google TV dongle. I keep saying dongle and it's just <laughs> it's a, it's a weird word. Me. It's OK. As someone it who is. has a as someone who has a desktop on my network with a very large multi terabyte hard drive mm -hmm. with a Plex server running on it and then mm -hmm. an NVIDIA Shield Pro, which I could store a ser which I could run a server on. But I'm using the Plex using the Plex app to pull from that server. I, I, you have no problem. I have no problem whatsoever ever with streaming that content from the desktop to the Plex uh, to the the Shield. And exactly. I can't imagine you have a problem with Chromecast either. That's good advice, Flo. Uh, Juan, do you, do, you, do you concur? Or? Exactly the same. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I finally rolled over to a little QNAP uh, NAS, uh, just a box of hard drives that's connected to my router. And it's really nice not needing to worry about what solution works with what smart TV, with what platform or what kind of storage might be compatible or should I use a flash drive? And I just put stuff on a giant stack of hard drives and it goes to everywhere on our network and it seems to work just fine. So yeah, as much as someone might be able to, or even just look at your router and see if you can plug a hard drive directly yep. into your yep. router and run it that way, yep. um, I, I think is probably the better solution. And then it won't matter. It won't matter if you have Chromecast or Shield or anything else. You can kind of, yep. kind of work uh, globally. There, there are is. a couple things to consider, though, if you are choosing between the two. Um, Google TV, slightly better, uh, or I should say the NVIDIA has a slight, NVIDIA Shield is a slightly better uh, functional remote, has a micro SD card slot, so you can expand storage that way. It also has 4K AI upscaling, which a lot of uh, has a lot of positive reviews across the board. But you will have to contend with that old Android TV UI for now because we're not sure when exactly it's going to be updated in 2021. So you're sort of waiting at Google's hands here uh, until they push through that update. And um, I got to tell you, Going to the Xiaomi Mi Box after spending like a week or two with the Google TV uh, in the other room, I don't like it. I, I really like the new <laughs> Google TV. Seriously, the, the Android TV is just not cutting it for me. I, I do like my suggestions being up in front. So some things to consider. Also, $150 asking price uh, more than the $50 Chromecast or Google TV. So yeah. major price differentiation. Just, just those the, the, are the very big things to consider. Those added features come at a cost, but it's not that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. anyway, I love my NVIDIA Shield. I think it's great. I swear by it. And I'll, I'll be patient for the Android TV update. I'm sure I'll do users. it eventually. It's yeah. a power user set-top box, but I think the biggest thing it has against it right now is just that Android TV software update is, is unknown for now. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah. Good point. All right. And now it is time for, I hope Burke is ready, the email of the week. There it is. And the email of the week uh, designation goes to one Mr. Richard Shepard, who wrote in about an issue with Android 11 that we actually got a bunch of emails from you in the community about in the last week. Um, so this is a hot topic, and I wanted to hear what Juan and Flo, what you think, if you've heard about this at all. Um, so Richard says, let me start by saying I really enjoy the show and have been a regular watcher for many years. Thank you, Richard. Um, he says, I have a Pixel 4a, my first Pixel, and I've loved it until I upgraded to Android 11. I use my phone as my primary audio source, and since the OS update, audio cuts out intermittent, intermittently, making it impossible to use. I've worked with Google Tech Support, sent them a bug report, but there's now acknowledgement of the issue. It appears to be a widespread across man any devices, but Google has not acknowledged this very serious bug. This issue is more widespread than Bluetooth or car connectivity. I have personally had the problem uh, issuing just the phone speakers to eliminate the Bluetooth piece. Can you take a look at the bugs on Android 11? They are significant and worthy of a story on your fine show. Mm -hmm. And I dug into this a little more, and it appears that um, when con connecting to Bluetooth and to cars or Bluetooth speakers, um, there is a problem with the audio that cuts out for seconds or minutes mm -hmm. and at first people thought it was related to notifications getting a message coming in or something like that and it, it going with that but that has been eliminated um and people don't know what's wrong and can you imagine having minutes of your podcast or music being cut out it and not knowing what's yeah happened? it did it happened to me, actually, this problem happened to me uh, when I went camping. We rented a car, it had Android Auto, 
And my podcast, which was locally stored, was skipping the entire time. It yep. was it was super annoying. And I was listening to one of those like recap podcasts. So it was missing parts of like the movie that we were recapping. <laughs> and it, it's a four hour drive, you know, so we were all listening right. to it. It was very annoying. I thought it was just a, a Bluetooth connection issue that maybe the the car stereo just kept connecting and disconnecting. And that's why it was doing that. But um, and it's interesting because I'm on, I'm on a one plus on Android 10. So. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I I was experiencing this on a one plus eight using one of the developer betas for Android 11. And so I, I was chalking it up to that. Oh, I'm on beta software. Yeah. This is probably what the situation is. Uh, but yeah, on my Pixel 4a too, I, I would say Bluetooth connections are now very intermittently uh, mm. uh, less stable. Mm. And um I, I, I haven't been able to pin it, pin down exactly what. So I've got like a, a ridiculous number of different like Bluetooth headsets and earbuds and things. And some seem to perform a little bit better than others. And so what I should probably do at some point is also just track. Is this an older headset with Bluetooth 4.2? Is there some problem with Bluetooth LE? Is this Bluetooth 5? And try and see if there's any correlation. The only reason I'm not is because I figure by the time I go through all of those headsets, Google will probably push out an update that fixes it. I'm really hoping. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, I mean, and like, Ron, I don't know if you've been able to find anything on this. Um, I was reading up on this independent of, of actually coming on the show. Right now, we're still in diagnosis mode. Yep. Like, there, there doesn't well, seem to be any good data on how to fix it. It's a major it's a major step in that not not only is it, we, it like if you look at the life cycle of these problems it's um it's kind of like this the steps of uh, recovery or whatever it is like first there's denial <laughs> right and right. then and then and then there's acknowledgement and actually admitting well, my that phone there's an never issue lags my phone it, never it, stutters <laughs> exactly and then it's admitting that there's a problem and then you get into diagnosis and then hopefully we get the fix so the fact that Google has now acknowledged that this exists and is listed you know in in product form and things like that and discuss yeah. and discussions. If you go dig in it, you'll find people talking about it. You got to hope that a, a future update will address this because that I mean, and I agree with Richard. I mean, it is downplayed, but that is a major impact. Like the number of people using Bluetooth yeah. speakers and car connectivity and Bluetooth headphones and things like that. And like these devices are, you know, are, are you know, audio listening devices. I go running. I listen to podcasts. We listen to music. We, you know, like they, they've been positioned that way. They just have to work. It shouldn't it shouldn't be, you know, a, 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 a post release fix. Like they should have caught that in in the period before it came out. So uh, really, yeah, really interesting. I, I, yeah. And and it definitely speaks to just how crazy complicated. I mean, we take it for granted that you know I open the case on my Pixel Buds and they automatically pair with a phone that's within the vicinity of my Pixel Buds. Um, we have made these things so complicated. We're still trying to hold on to legacy connections. We're still trying to improve security where Bluetooth is not the best security platform for having sensitive information travel off of your device into another accessory. Um, we're dealing with different formats of wireless connectivity from Bluetooth 4 to Bluetooth 5 and the bullet points, you know, in between. Um, it, it, the, it, I'm going to be the snarky git, at least on a Pixel 4a, you have a fallback where you can plug in cables. <laughs> you absolutely need to keep a stable audio connection. But it is a concern for Android, uh, you know, moving forward because so many premium phones now lack that ability uh, to, to easily just, you know, switch over to a competing solution like a 3.5 millimeter jack. So uh, on the one hand, I want to be somewhat sympathetic, like every platform, every phone, no computer is ever complete. You know, no software is ever finished. Everything is a fluid moving target of updates and bug fixes. And you fix one bug and then it creates another bug somewhere else. Maybe this is a security issue with the way that Android 11 is handling background processes. You know, there could be something deep in that Android code that has nothing to do with Bluetooth or audio, but is looking at communication on the phone and saying, well, this is a non-essential communication. And for security reasons, we're going to interrupt what's going on. It's it's getting incredibly difficult to try and like hone in on what might actually be causing a problem like this. And I, I, it's, I think it's a crazy job. It is definitely a thankless job. Like 
I, I can't imagine what software engineers are going through right now to try and make something consistently functional on a pocket su supercomputer these days. Yeah. It's it's like it's like a crazy detailed whack a mole. Whack a mole. So, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Pocket right, supercomputers. Well, well thank you, like Richard, for bringing up this issue, and that gives you the email of the week. So, Flo, you're saying pocket supercomputers. I was going to say <laughs> pocket supercomputers is a great way for us to end out the show because that's what we were talking about today. All these pocket supercomputers, which thankfully our guest, Juan Bagnell, has really helped us cover today. Thank you, Juan, for being here today and for just like bringing all the hardware and having all these great takes. Um, you're pretty great. Thanks for being here. Oh, uh, you know, <laughs> you guys are pretty great, too. I, anytime you guys want to have me back and, you know, tout the superiority of cabled audio solutions, uh, I'll, I'll be your guy. So listen, you're consistent. Times. So, <laughs> you know, people know what I, they're getting. <laughs> if, if you'll pardon the plug, uh, Android Central just put together an incredible collaboration video of, of just like all kinds of different YouTubers talking about their headphones. Um, and uh, I was very appreciative where they even let me join that conversation knowing that I was going to whine about <laughs> headphone cables and hearing loss and stuff. So uh, that 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 was any anytime, you know, you you, you guys want to have that kind of a chat, you know, I'm absolutely down to jump in and and, and soapbox about that. So it's good. And that's why we and that, that's why we love you Juan. So exactly. <laughs> I was going to ask one, where's the best place for people to find you if they want to learn more about you after this show? Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, Burke's pulling it up right now on the on the stream. It's uh, if you go to somegadgetguy.com, that's sort of the main hub for where I, I kind of put everything that I'm working on. Uh, I, I obviously the, around the social medias, you can find me as some gadget guy. I'm producing with Newegg. I might be picking up a couple new editorial beats soon. Um, but you know, uh, trying to talk about better competition, trying to talk about tech and politics, um, and then also mm -hmm. still revisiting conversations about, uh, hearing health and hearing loss. Um, the major sort of talking points I've had for 2020 and hopefully trying to encourage more, uh, techies to join those conversations. Cause I feel like we should be leading these conversations, not just always reacting to what's going on around us. 100%. Thank you Juan again for being here. Hey, Ron. Ron, Ron, Ron. Thank you yes. for helping me today. Thank you, Flo, for helping me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, Flo, where can people find you and know what you're doing? Where can people find me? You can find me at florenceion.com. That's my website. In fact, today I posted about my keyboard and how it made me cry. So if anybody would like to go see this keyboard that made me cry, please. florenceion.com is where you can find that information. Enjoy. What about you, Ron? <laughs> uh, you can go follow me over on Twitter and Instagram at RonXO, and you can check out scorebit.io, which is the website for my startup where we are connecting pinball machines to the internet, uh, selling a fun piece of hardware called the Scorbitron. We have a Android app you can download in the Google Play Store called Scorbit where you can keep track of your pinball scores. Um, if you're into pinball, check it out uh, and get on board. It's the future. So, yay. Yay! Um, I also want to give a big thanks to Burke. Burke, thanks for just, you know, putting up with everything we're throwing your way today. Uh, big thanks to Anthony, who will be editing this show afterwards. And uh, I guess it's time now to officially say our goodbyes and officially close out the show. Hey, don't forget that the end of the year is coming and we really need your help with the end of the year best of episodes. If you can recall any time within the last, mm, I don't know, what are we now at like 40 three weeks or something of the year uh, where you laughed, where you cried, where you gasped, uh, or maybe you were just stumped. You can submit your episode at twit.tv slash best of. So please help us out there. It's, it's a fun thing that we love to do every year at the end of the year. Um, hey, you can also follow Twit on the social medias at 
Twit on Twitter, twit.tv on Instagram, and everywhere else that you get your social media goodness. Um, hey, don't forget also to wear a mask. It saves lives. You can get some pretty cool ones if you like, including from our store at twit.tv slash store. Show pride for your favorite podcast on your mouth as you are saving the lives of others. Um, that's it for us this week. If you would like to leave us a voicemail uh, or become somebody that contributes to our email of the week, you can do that at... <laughs> <laughs> you can leave a voicemail at 347-SHOW at triple A. That's three A's. Or you can email us at triple A at twit.tv. That's three A's again. You can also subscribe to us at twit.tv slash triple A. Again, with the three A's. That's right. We are three A's for all about Android. Um, that's it for me. And that's it from us. And we're going to be back next week with Jason leading the helm. So until then, everybody, be safe. Have fun and bye for now. Good night. Good night. I'm Jason Howell, host of Hands On Android, where each week I take a look at the Android operating system, and really dive deep into what it can do for you and how it can improve your quality of life, whether it be tips and tricks on how to use it better, whether it can be little known secrets that open up a world of possibilities. So many topics to dive into, including your emails. Subscribe by going to twit.tv slash HOA. We'll see you there. <laughs>